the passage on which the uh, <clears throat> teaching this morning is based is printed in your bulletin. You'll find it in uh, the place where, if you're following the service, where you would be right now. It's Acts chapter 2, verses 40 to 47. This is the end of a passage we've been going through consecutively from week to week, and we come to the place where Peter has finished his sermon on the very first day of the church's history called Pentecost, and we read in verse 40, Now with many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is God's Word. Now, we've been looking, and today we look for the last time, at the aftermath of the Sermon of Peter. We were told by this document, it's a historical document, about what happened on the very first day of the church's history, that Peter preached a sermon. And we're told that on that day, 3,000 people believed. There were 120 people who were adherents of the Christian faith before that sermon, and afterwards there were 3,120. And within a couple of days, we're not sure quite how soon, but as you read along, we'll see in the book of Acts, within just a couple of days, another 2,000 joined. There was explosive church growth, and it didn't end there because we know that Christian faith swept through the Roman Empire, and the question is, why? What accounts for that kind of power, that kind of reception? And we said, again, and we especially pointed it out last week, it's because there was a spiritual power that attended the message. The preaching was okay. It wasn't the most eloquent uh, message in the world there was a spiritual power attending it, they were cut to the heart, we read. They were cut to the heart. By what? New life. When they said, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. And Peter says, turn and the Holy Spirit will come in. So they were cut to the heart. There was an incision made. So the Holy Spirit, in a sense, it's all a metaphor here, was inserted. And that's the reason why. They got this new life in them. About about a month ago, and a lot of you would have been here probably a month ago, uh, a man who was just uh, here for some, on some other business wandered in near the end of our service, and he watched us singing at the end of the communion service. Some of you might have been here then. We were, we were at the, near the end of the communion service, and we were singing, I will raise him up. You know that song? I will raise him up. And he watched, and afterwards he came up to me, and he said, what do you people believe? I asked him why he wanted to know, and he said... I've been in churches, though I don't go to church anymore, but I said I've never seen people's faces glow like the people here. I've never seen people so engaged. What do you believe? Now, here's what he saw. He sees people cut to the heart. Christians are the original bleeding hearts, you know. And he was trying to get a hold of it. Now, I believe what he saw is real. But the Bible would never say that the way you know that the new life is present in a congregation or in a community or in a life, the Bible would never say the way you know is that glowing faces. You know, they'd never say that. Here's why. It's true that if you've received the new life, your face will glow. But it is not necessarily true that if your face is glowing, you've received the new life because there's a lot of things that can make your face glow. So even though you saw the reality, the question is, how do we know it's here? How do we know the new life is here? How do we know new life is present? How do we know we've actually been cut to the heart by it? Now, this passage, which is so filled with signs of the new life, this passage is so filled with them that uh, you could easily make a list of 10, 15, or 20, and some people do, but I'd like to break it all down into two, just two. 
And we looked at one last week, and we're looking at one this week. Truth and love. There's a whole new attitude toward the truth. Whether you believed in truth or not, it comes at you. We looked at that last week. But there's a whole new attitude. There's a, there's, there's a love that happens that is inexplicable except by reference to supernatural causes and factors. Let me show you briefly what it is, what this sign is, and then we'll ask some questions to try to explain it and break it down. What is this sign? It's in verse 44. It says, they were together. Now, I want you to see the strength of this for a moment. They were together. Now, there's another place where it says they met together. You notice down in verse 47, it says they met together. But what I'm looking at is the place where it says they were together. I'll show you why that's so strong. Where did they meet together? Everywhere. It's, we're told in the temples, but in the temple, but also in their homes. They met everywhere. When did they meet together? Constantly, relentlessly. It says every day, continuously. Do you see that? And I tell you what this means. The Christians met for the things they did, and we'll talk about what those are in a minute. Christians came together every single day in the temple for worship and the other things that they did, and then they couldn't get enough of each other. They kept going on in their homes. They went to the temple, and then they went to their homes, and they continued with it. You see in verse 46, it says they met in the temple courts, and then at the end it says, and in their homes. What does this mean? These people could not get enough of each other. These people were always coming together. They came together every day. They were hungry for each other. Regular life was seen as an interruption. They couldn't be kept apart. And that's the reason why the word together is not so much something they did, it was something they were. That's why, that's why it says they were together. Not just that they came together, not just they met together, that they did come together, that they did meet together. They were together. They were each other. They entered into a whole new mode of existence. So you see how radical this change is. They were together. They've become together. They were apart. Now they've become together. They were individuals. Now they've become together. And here's what's so interesting. Surely some of you over the years have been subjected to ministers like me, laying either subtle or not so subtle guilt trips on people, especially on Christmas and Easter, you know, saying, why don't you come to all the meetings? Why don't you come to church every week? Why don't you come to this and why don't you come to that? You'll never see this in the book of Acts. Oh, I'm not saying it's wrong to urge people, but you don't see the apostles doing it. They never say, why don't you come out more often? They couldn't stop them. The people wanted to. They were hungry to. They came after. You see, here's why. It's a sign of life. You don't tell a baby, cry. <laughs> Come on, honey, cry. You don't do that. If the baby's alive, it cries. And you don't have to tell people who've got the new life to come together. Not if the new life is high. Not if the new life is flourishing. You don't have to. They don't come together as a response to a command, they don't come together as a response to a duty, though it is a duty, and it is a command. They don't come together as a response to tradition or family or civic virtue or anything like that. They come together as a response to the life, the same reason that the child cries. That's the sign. That's radical. That's new. It's a sign of life. Now, here's what we have to look at. What do we learn to explain this? Especially since a lot of us have to admit, immediately admit that this sign is not very evident in our own lives. Now, if a sign like this is not very evident in our own lives, if it's not there at all, then you may not be a Christian. And if it once was there, but it's gotten weaker, or if it's always been there, but it's been very weak, then you need to say, Lord, I've got to have more of your new life because this is a sign of that new life. I need to have it stirred up in me. So let's take a look and see what this sign is. Let me just ask four questions. Who came together? Okay. What they did when they came together. Why they really came together. And how they came together. Okay. Who, what, why, how. Brief, but I want to, I want, you know, I want to turn the diamond and I want each facet to sort of you know, gleam in your eye. 
First of all, notice the first thing. Who are these people that cannot get enough of each other? They're in each other's homes every night. They're breaking bread together. They're rejoicing in each other. You see, glad hearts. Whenever they got together, there was great awe. You see that? You see that word there? It says great awe was upon all of them. Great fear, it says in the old King James. Whenever they got together, there was a sense of God's presence. There was awe and yet intimacy. Who were these people getting together all the time? You could never keep them out of each other's lives. They were together. The first thing is to see who it is. And the only way to see it is to go back and remember the whole rest of the chapter. And let me just lay this out because there's nothing more that America right now needs to hear than this. If you go back, we're told who the crowd was. Do you remember this was not a normal Jerusalem crowd that they preached this gospel to? Do you remember that? It was a particular time of festival and people were in Jerusalem from all over the world and we're told, literally it says in chapter 2, verse 5, every nation under heaven, which really means that there was an incredible diversity out there. Yeah, let me read it to you. It says, who were in the crowd? It says, both Jews and Gentiles. It says some were both Jews and Gentiles. Parthians, Egyptians, Libyans, Arabs, Cretans, Romans. Now listen. Some people say, oh, I know what makes people religious. Religion is an expression of temperament, right? Some of you say, yes, there's religious types, there's religious personalities, there's kinds of temperament, kinds of psychology. Some people like that, some people need that. Some people enjoy all those meetings, you know. Not me, I'm not the touchy-feely type. I think religion's a private thing. It's a temperament thing, it's a psychological thing. How could that be? Every single kind of person was present. And here's the other thing. Many people say religion is an expression of culture. Religion is just an expression of culture. If you're Italian, you're Catholic. If you're Jewish, you're into Judaism. If you're Arab, you're into Islam. If you're Scottish, you're Presbyterian, and on and on. It's an expression of culture. That couldn't be here because there was every culture possible, every race, every class, every temperament. And here's what's so astonishing. These are people who seemingly, therefore, had nothing in common. They do not have a common culture. They do not have a common personality. They do not have a common temperament, not have a common class. And yet these are the people who immediately are in each other's homes every night. They were together. They, they were together. You couldn't keep them apart. How could this be? There is nothing more on America's mind right now than this, is there? I mean, America had a kind of intellectual understanding that we are a divided country, that we're divided by race and class and other factors. This week, everybody's saying, I had no idea how divided. We don't have a common grammar. We can't even talk. And yet here are people far more divided who immediately were one. They were together. They were in each other's homes. This is a historical fact. You can say, oh, you know, you're exaggerating. This is a historical fact. You remember the, the, uh, the, uh, the historian from Yale that I, I quoted some, a couple weeks ago about why Christianity was so successful. He wrote a number of essays on why did Christianity succeed in the Roman Empire? There were hundreds of other religions. They were vying for ascendancy. Do you remember that? And he said one of the great questions that historians have to ask is what made Christianity have this enormous triumph in Rome? Why didn't any of the other ones do it? And this is one of the reasons. Listen. The fourth reason for Christianity's success, says this historian, is to be found in its absolute inclusiveness. More than any other of its competitor religions, it attracted all races and classes. The pagan deities, for example, were often tied and confined to certain regions and nations. And even in the days of its most active proselytizing activities, Judaism never overcame its racial boundaries because converts had to become culturally Jewish. Christianity, however, gloried in its appeal to Jew, Gentile, African, and barbarian. The philosophers of Greece and Rome, on the other hand, appealed to the educated only and could never win the masses. It was one of the charges against Christianity that it drew the lowly and uneducated multitude that its essential teaching was so simple that anybody could understand. Yet Christianity also developed a philosophy that converted some of the greatest minds in the society. And Christianity, too, was for both sexes, and women were active in its work. 
while two of its main competitor religions were almost exclusively for men. Finally, the mystery religions were mainly for the rich. Initiation was very expensive. There was no other religion that took in all groups and all stratas of society. The one tenable explanation of Christianity's inclusiveness was probably its teaching of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. For if Jesus was not a teacher showing the way of salvation, but the Son of God who accomplished salvation, then members of both sexes and all races, the learned and the unlearned, the high and the low, the able and the non-able, might all be able to share in the salvation made possible in Christ. Now what's he talking about? This is a fact. This happened. The thing that we most want, the thing that societies today are crying out, happened. There's nothing else like it that does that. There was a, um, there was a, one man that, that speaks most eloquently about this is a, a pastor who, uh, whose tapes, though he's dead and he's been dead for several years, uh, he, he preached in the 40s and 50s and I have tapes that I listened to of some of his sermons and he preached a sermon on this very passage. He was a Welsh doctor who became a preacher in London during World War II. And he says, during World War II, soldiers who were st Christians who were soldiers were stationed from all over the globe in London. They'd come from all kinds of uh, places in the world and all sorts of societies and all sorts of cultures and all sorts of classes. And sometimes after the service, he would go into a study and they'd come to see him. And he says, it's amazing how often they would walk in. And I love the way he put this. He says, they'd walk into the study and instantly they would realize they knew me. And I knew them. And it doesn't mean they'd met before. It doesn't mean they had a mutual friend or a mutual relative. What he meant was, I realized that there was a commonality between us that was deeper than national ties, deeper than racial ties, deeper than biological ties, deeper than political ties. In fact, Lloyd-Jones realized, because he became a Christian in his early 20s, in the early 20s of the century, when British society was much more stratified than it is now and much more stratified than America ever was. And he immediately recognized something of great interest to him. And that was this. He said, though he was a, a person from a high... Excuse me, I wonder what, what's doing that. Am I causing that? I wonder. I don't know. Am I causing that? All right. I don't want to distract you from this very important point. It wasn't very long after he had become a Christian that he suddenly realized something. Though he was from a high strat of society, he was from uh, the educated classes, when he began to minister in a little town in Wales, he said he suddenly realized something. And that something was this. He said, I suddenly realized that I would rather talk about the Lord all day with the humblest old fisherwoman than to sit at a club with my social peers in the company of the highest circles who don't know him. He suddenly realized, he said, I don't understand this. I feel a, a oneness with people who are not for my class at all. And look at Paul. Here's Paul the Apostle. He was a man of the highest intellect, and yet he writes to slaves and, and to ignorant people and uneducated people in his, in his, in his uh, churches, like in Corinth and all, and he says, I long to be with you. Now, does this mean, here's this intellectual colossus sitting down with the learned, unlearned, and the uncouth, you know, by his standards, and sharing his life and sharing his heart and longing to do it. This does not mean that a guy who knew the Greek poets and knew Roman law and was so sophisticated and such a scholar wouldn't occasionally enjoy a really good talk with a person at his intellectual level, but he knew that that wasn't fellowship. He knew the difference between real oneness and real sharing and scintillating conversation. Do you? I mean, this is a test. A man just the other day who was converted here in this church told me, before he was converted, he says, I came from a very liberal background, a very artistic background. He says the most amazing thing in the world to him is that now his best friend in the world, who's another Christian, is a razor-cut, button-down Wall Street investment banker. He says, the kind of people I used to despise, utterly despise. I read The Voice. He read The Wall Street Journal. I mean, what, you know, what, what did we have in common? And he says, it's astonishing to him because suddenly the things that seemed to divide him 
became like nothing. And yet they are different. And they, and you know, they very often spar and they've enriched each other because they're able to even talk about their politics because there's something deeper than politics. I want to ask you a question. Do you have a list of people like that? Have you got people that the gospel has brought you into close connection with that before you would have despised? People of different temperament. You know, here's a touchy-feely type and you just hate that kind of person and suddenly you're bosom friends. You see? Black, white, professional, blue-collar, liberal, conservative. Have you got people? Look who came together. Third, next, what did they do when they came together? Not just, I don't want to just see who came together, but what did they do? And they always did these things. And I just kind of to run through the list because this is where you could easily have a sermon on each one. You could have a, a series of five sermons here. You're not going to get that. But whenever they came together, they always did the same things. Whether they were in a large group or in a small group, they always did the same things. Look carefully. In verse 42, you see three things that they always did when they met. You could put them into three L's. You could say learning, loving, and liturgy. But uh, I'll explain that. The three things they always did, they studied the apostles' teaching. And we t said last week that that's the New Testament now. They studied it. They devoted themselves to it. They studied it and reflected on it and, and, and digested it. Secondly, they loved each other. That means they, it says they devoted themselves to the fellowship. Now you say, what do you, mean? what do you mean devoted yourself to the fellowship? Well, though they had this great thing in common, the new life, they worked it out. You know, here's your chocolate chips and you, you have to work them in to the dough to make chocolate chip cookies. You have them, but you've got to work them in. You have fellowship, but you have to work it in. You, ha you have to work on, you have to work at that commonality that you have. And they did that when they met together. They bore each other's burdens. They were able to be honest with each other about their sins in a way that they could never have been honest to other people before. You know, to somebody else who thinks that basically the way you make it in life is by hiding your flaws, never letting them see you sweat, letting people think that you're in charge. That's the way of the world. You're not going to confess your sins. You're not going to have fellowship. You're not going to say, here I am. But when you deal with somebody else who has realized the gospel, and that is, you humble yourself. You admit that you don't have what it takes. You throw yourself on the Savior. Well, that's a, that creates an entirely different situation. Finally, you're able to be naked and unashamed with somebody. They bore each other's burdens. They confessed sins. They welcomed and affirmed, and yet they admonished and they confronted. That was the fellowship. They worked at it. They did it when they got together. And lastly, notice it says the breaking of bread and prayers. And every scholar, anybody who reads this thing in the Greek, notices that there's an article there. It doesn't just say in breaking of bread, which could just mean eating. The breaking of bread means this is the Lord's Supper. It, that was the way in which they talked about it. This is the Lord's Supper. And what they were doing was they were worshiping. They were doing corporate worship. They broke the bread to remember the Lord's death, to remember the one who died for them in corporate worship. So there was learning and lo loving and liturgy. There was always studying the Word of God. There was always fellowship and there was the worship. Now, they did that in the small groups and they did it in the large groups. They did it in the temple courts and they did it in the homes. And as a result, we're told what? We're told, as a result, and you can see it in verse 44, one of the results was deed ministry. And down in verse 47, the other result was word ministry. Deed ministry means, you see what verse 44 says? It says, they were so generous with their goods, there was no poor Christian among them. And we know from church history that they were generous with their goods outside. One of the things that happened, the more they did the learning and loving and liturgy, the learning and loving and liturgy, it turned them into generous people. But then secondly, we're told that every day the church grew. It says daily God was adding to them. Why? Because they had favor with all the people. And that means not so much that they had evangelistic programs, but what they had was such attractive lives and such an attractive community that they found people becoming converted because they wanted to know what's going on. I must tell you, the only time in my life that I've ever really seen a group 
of Christians grow like this from 15 to 100 in one year was the first year I really was a Christian in 1970 in a little college fellowship. And we had no preaching, by the way. We had no good preacher at all. We didn't have any preacher. We had no programs. We didn't have any kind of evangelistic program. I'll tell you what we had. We were so excited with our new life. I was in a small group that met two hours a day. Yeah, well, we did it for 45 minutes before before meal, right before the cafe, right outside the cafeteria in somebody's room, we would meet and say, what has God been teaching you uh, in your time of devotions? What has God been teaching you in the Bible? How's your life been going? For 45 minutes, we would meet, we'd share those things, and we'd pray, and we'd go eat together. Two hours a day. And then one whole evening a week, we met together for the same things, learning and loving and liturgy. And you know what happened? That place exploded because we had a bunch of those groups that were doing that kind of thing. There's always that. They reinforce each other. The learning, the loving, the worship, the deed ministry, the in integrity of lives, the word ministry, the evangelism, the persuasiveness, the favor with all the people. They come together. You take one out, it all falls apart. Signs of life. That's what they did. You need to look at yourselves here. It's so complete. Have you got both large group and small group experiences in your life? They did. Do you? Do you have both doctrinal and relational aspects? In other words, do you really study the resources, the theology, the Bible? Are you a cognitive type and you really don't like people? It's cognitive, you know, doctrinal but not relational. Or on the other hand, are you relational but you really don't like all the doctrinal? Who knows? I hate to, I hate to be dogmatic. No, the signs of life is they're all together. These things reinforce each other. These things bring each other. But next... We said who met together, and we've said what they did when they met together. But there was a power and there's an engine driving this. And that you see at the end, and this is the most important thing to see as we conclude. It says here in verse 47, it says, 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and generous hearts, Praising God. Now, that is actually what they were doing when they were studying the Apostles' Doctrine. That's what they were doing when they were loving each other. That's what they were doing when they were learning, when they were worshiping. That's what, even what they're doing when they're evangelizing and telling people about the good news. Praising God is the dynamite. Praising God is the engine. And I'll tell you why. C.S. Lewis has a very interesting thing to say about aesthetics that actually is very germane to us right now. Lewis says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise does not merely express but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It is not simply to compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight itself is incomplete until it's expressed. That's very profound but it's something we all know. When you really find a piece of music you love, when you find an artwork you love, in fact, even when you find a great athlete, you know, you, you know, Willie Mays' catch on Vic Wirtz in the 1954 World Series is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. And when you see something beautiful, there is, Lewis says, there is something about the beautiful thing itself that makes you want to grab somebody and pull them in and say, look! Listen, you have to. You know why? He says, beautiful objects demand praise. Every beautiful object demands praise. And the joy you get from a beautiful object has to get out. It has to liberate itself in praise. You have to praise. You say, look how great that is. Look at that incredible catch. Look at that extension. You know, you're praising it. You have to do it. And you do not find that your joy is completed until it utters itself and, some, and it's conveyed to somebody else. And when somebody else says, yeah, your joy finds itself. Do you see what Lewis says? He says, you do not simply express your joy. You complete your joy when you praise the object of beauty. If you don't understand this, you won't understand any of the things that Christians do when they get together. Do you know why we get together? Do you know why we have to get together? The more beautiful an object, the more the joy you have in it surges and needs to get out in praise. 
And the more it needs to be visited with other people who praise it too. A beautiful cat is one thing. A beautiful human being is another thing. The higher the object, the more your appreciation of it bursts you. It pushes you to praise. And so here's what we do. When we have fellowship, we're grading other people who see the same beauty and say, look at that. And the more perfect our praise is from week to week. What do you think I'm doing up here every week? Why do you see me sometimes getting agitated? Why do you see me sort of stretching, looking for illustrations, looking for eloquence? What do you think I'm doing? I'm trying to get it out. I see something beautiful, and I'm saying, look, it's the same reason that you drag your friends to the CD player and say, listen to this. Because the more beautiful the object, the more that joy in you surges to get out, and the more perfectly you can praise it, the higher you find the joy. It demands to be praised. That's what we're doing when we get together. Christians don't just like to get together because the reason that communists like to get together, the reason that Republicans like to get together, it's nice to be with other people who, who affirm your prejudices. It's so nice not to be contradicted. It just feels so warm and toasty. That's not it. Absolutely not. That's not the reason these people, Republicans don't meet every day. <laughs> Even communists don't meet every day. What are the, why do these people meet every day? You know what fellowship is? How do we comfort each other? We don't just say they're there. We say, praise the one who was broken for you. It'll be okay. We're praising the one who was broken. That's why they broke bread all the time. Don't you see? How do we confront each other? We look at each other and we say, praise the one who was so holy that he would die for sin. How can you do this? How do we confront each other? By praising God to each other. How do we comfort each other? By praising God to each other. How do we heal people who are guilty? By praising God, the mercy of God, or the holiness of God. That's what we're doing. Why do we evangelize? It's impossible for the person on the outside to understand this. People say, you know, it's very narrow-minded to try to convert people. All we're doing is getting the joy out. Well, they say, you know, it's nice for you, but you shouldn't try to persuade somebody else. What are you talking about? We don't just see him as nice for us. We see him as an absolute beauty. We see him as supreme. We, that's what we see him as. And of course, we have to be sensitive. My wife doesn't care about Willie Mays' catch on Vic Wirtz. But that's just a matter of taste. A person, because of the sin in their heart, may not care about the beauty of the Lord, and you have to be sensitive even to that. But that's what we're doing. And that's why we do it. And that's what drives us. And that's how you work on fellowship, my dear friends. You notice how it says they were devoted to fellowship? Devoted. Are you devoted to fellowship? Are you devoted to being one with people who are Christians? You know how you do it? Some of you are bitter against some other Christian right now. You've got to be devoted to fellowship. How do you do it? You praise the broken Lord. Get rid of your bitterness. It's inconsistent with the broken Lord. Some of you are indifferent. You look around, you see some people that you'd like to be, you know, you look around a Christian church and you say, some of these people are my kind of people. Other people aren't your kind of people. I like these kinds of people. I don't like this kind of people. You are not. Listen, you cannot think of Jesus Christ. You can't praise the sacrifice of Christ and want to take somebody's head off at the same time. You cannot praise his dying for you and be indifferent to other people at the same time. You can't. Oh, you may know that he died on the cross, but that's not what we're talking about. What creates fellowship is praising him for doing it, rejoicing in it, focusing on it. You see? If you have bitterness in your heart toward, toward any other believer, in fact, if you have bitterness in your heart toward anybody else, it's because you are not praising him for his death on the cross for you. What if he hadn't done that? What if he hadn't forgiven you? You can't look at his forgiveness of you and withhold forgiveness from somebody else at the same time. You have to look at one and forget the other. Look at him. And we will break all the barriers of culture. We will break all the barriers of race. We will break all the barriers of temperament. We'll break all the barriers of your history, no matter what they did to you. Indifference, sensitivity, hurt feelings, anger, passivity, all of them go away. Because we've praisen, praised the one who is broken for you. Do that. Be devoted to fellowship. Stir up this sign of new life in you and in this church. Let's pray. Give us, O oh Father. Give us, O oh Father. 
a touch of what these early Christians had. As we praise the one who was broken for us, we will find the brokenness of human relationships becoming whole. The more we look at his brokenness for us, the more we will be, the less broken we will be in our relationships. Now, Lord, everybody in this room has got something to deal with. Some of us don't like other kinds of people who also happen to be Christians. Some of us are just, we like our privacy. Some of us just don't want to be bothered. Some of us certainly don't want to give away much of our money to anybody. Some of us are struggling with racial prejudice. Some of us are struggling with class prejudice. Some of us are just struggling with our temperaments. We don't like people. Some of us are always nursing hurt feelings. Oh, Lord. Help us to be devoted to fellowship, to work at fellowship, because we are praising, we're rejoicing in the beauty of the one who was broken for us. In his name we pray, amen. The less we've broken, we will be in our relationships. Now, Lord, everybody in this room has got something to deal with. Some of us don't like other kinds of people who also happen to be Christians. Some of us are just, we like our privacy. Some of us just don't want to be bothered. Some of us certainly don't want to give away much of our money to anybody. Some of us are struggling with racial prejudice. Some of us are struggling with class prejudice. Some of us are just struggling with our temperaments. We don't like people. Some of us are always nursing hurt feelings. Oh, Lord, help us to be devoted to fellowship, to work at fellowship, because we are praising, we're rejoicing in the beauty of the one who was broken for us. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you for listening today. Gospel and Life's ministry is supported by generous partners all over the world. Your gifts allow us to share the gospel message with millions of people through our podcast, radio, and other channels, including here on YouTube. We're seeing God change lives through the increasing reach of this ministry, so thank you for your part in it. If you'd like to make a gift today, go to gospelandlife.com slash YouTube, and we'll send you one of my books as thanks for your gift. Thank you again for your generous support, because the gospel really does change everything.